Hello, everyone. Let me know if there's any audio issues in the chat. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for coming to the 2022 Simulation and Game Development Capstone presentation. Our students have been hard at work for the last nine weeks creating games from scratch. I'm happy that you are here to witness their hard work and success. For those of you who might not know the background of this, let me take a few moments to explain how these students got here. This is the capstone class for our department, Simulation and Game Development. These students have been studying hard for the last two years to gain skills in video game art, programming, and sometimes they do both. At the start of this class, they split into teams and have the semester to design, construct, test, polish, and complete a game. We have six teams this year, and their projects are all completely different in idea and direction. They have put together videos to introduce themselves to show off their games. After the videos, all of the teams will have live streams of their own so that they can show off the games in more detail and answer questions that you have. If you can find the links in their descriptions below and also to their websites that have links to their playable games on itch.io. So I hope that you do take advantage of that. I want to make sure to thank all of the people who have supported these students through their journey. Wake Tech and the professors of simulation and game development um, were able to give them the space and knowledge to grow as game developers. This semester, we had Ken Turner, the department head, stop by and give val valuable feedback during the development process. Red Bull was also gracious enough to visit our class multiple times with their e-athletes and team to talk to our students and give critique. Justin Johnson, a professor from NC State's Art and Design Department, also stopped by to give design critique. And of course, we should also thank the families of all of the students who were there to support them, not only for this class, but through their journey through Wake Tech. Finally, don't forget to fill out the survey. This feedback that the, is important for the teams and, will, and your critique will allow them to improve their abilities. Um, and it's also used as part of their um, final grade for this course. So I would like to um, start off this with our first project called Eternus. I'm not going to talk a little bit anything about this video. I'm just going to let it speak for itself. So give me a moment to get this one started. Hi, my name is Carly Cito, um, and I'm the lead artist and creative director of the game Eternus. Uh, so my responsibilities included uh, 3D modeling and texturing, uh, and also the environmental art, which included like the atmosphere, the soundtrack, and the lighting of the game. Hello everyone, my name is Logan Pomper, and I'm the lead QA tester and level designer for Eternus. I was in charge of designing the game's levels, creating extra environment models, and managing quality assurance testing. Hey all, my name is Gilberto Estrada, and I'm the lead character artist for Eternus. My role in the development of Eternus was the creation and animation of the characters. Hi everyone, I'm Josiah, I'm the lead programmer on Eternus. I primarily worked on making player movement, environmental interactions, as well as the user interface. 
My name is Vin, and I'm one of the programmers on Eternus. I worked on AI, general gameplay, and overall file management. So Eternus is a first-person survival horror game uh, where the player must solve puzzles in order to progress through the game. So some of these puzzles include locating keys, unlocking doors, uh, and crawling through vents in order to progress. Throughout the game, the player is able to hide under objects such as laundry bins or beds, uh, allowing the player to hide from multiple enemies throughout the game. So going from floor to floor, the main objective is to escape from the hell that is Eternus. One of my favorite parts of development early on was taking the white boxes I created for the levels and filling them out with textured models created by our artists. It felt very fulfilling to see everything slowly go from being untextured cubes to detailed models as development continued. The biggest challenge throughout the development of Eternus was actually self-teaching myself how to rig characters because this was the first time I had actually done it myself. Um, it was a very challenging experience but it's a very rewarding one. My process for creating the enemies in Eternus started in ZBrush where I sculpted the high poly models and then also got the low poly models by retopologizing them in ZBrush as well. From ZBrush I moved to Blender and using Simply Cloth Pro I created the clothing for the enemies. I wanted to have the player movement feel fluid and immersive but not cumbersome. The player can do things like sprinting, jumping, and interacting with different things. The player is also able to hide inside certain props. When a player interacts with those props, they go inside the prop restrict movement, limit viewing angles, and stop enemies from chasing the play. I also worked on the main user interface of the project. Me and my team wanted something simple and minimalistic, but also something that gives feedback when you push buttons or hover over them. Overall, I think the combination of the movement and mechanics makes for a really immersive experience that I hope you'll all enjoy. The AI and Eternus all run using the Unity Nav Mesh. This was the fastest and easiest method, as attempting to program and debug a self-written A-star script would take a bit more time than we were given. This isn't to say, of course, that the pathfinding was easy. The hag's movement was the most challenging since her movement is restricted to the rig she's attached to. I had to find a way to keep her mesh attached to the tracks. In the end, I ended up having to create a duplicate of the ceiling rig to bake the nav mesh onto, then give the hag her own set of nav mesh agent values so that she wouldn't speed off the track. My biggest challenge in this project has been managing the team's files. We used GitHub for our source control, and it's been tough keeping everyone's work separate and organized. Needless to say, we've known our fair share of merge conflicts. So the reason our team decided to use the setting of an abandoned hospital, because it was the best setting for the complex enemy, the hag. Um, because of the way she moves, there's a lot of restrictions, especially with architecture. With that in mind, we decided to use an insane asylum, which is dressed in 1960s decor. The architecture that was used as a reference was the Victorian era hospitals. This was because of their twisting and turning hallways, which can be quite confusing. Uh, and that was definitely taken advantage of when, the, when we began designing the level. Disorienting the player, along with the atmospheric choices, uh, really made the player feel a lot of uncertainty, and that is exactly what we wanted.
Hi. Coming up next in a completely different direction is a game called Three is Too Many. I'm Will Jones and I was the team lead and lead level designer for the competitive level in Three is Too Many. When designing the, the game Three is Too Many, our team came up with the idea of having more than one map, but we knew that there was starting to have to be a flagship model, a map that uh, was the baseline of the rest of the game. That map for us was the competitive level. I had the pleasure of designing and building all the assets for that map. The whole point of the map was to give you the three done shooting experience within the digital realm. While playing through, you'll pick up a rifle, a shotgun, and a pistol. When I designed this map, I had to learn how to use new tools such as speed tree, which you can see I used to create the trees and some of the bushes in this level. I also designed all of the targets, some of which you know, are designed so that you shoot and they fall over, some of which move back and forth. And then some of those targets will actually continue to spin around in circles as you shoot them. One of the things I'm quite happy with how it turned out was I wanted to create a experience where the play didn't feel so linear and so uh, one dimensional. I wanted the player to feel like there was a lot going on without overloading their senses in order to create a realistic feel. Overall, I'm very happy with how this map came out and I really appreciate all the help that my team was able to offer me. Hi, I'm Joseph Dominic and I am the level designer and modeler for the sci-fi level in Threes Too Many. Alright, I'll be taking over for now. My name is Joseph Dominic, and I had the privilege of bringing everything you see in this sci-fi level to life. When we first decided on the concept of adding a sci-fi level, I immediately knew what I wanted to create. Laser tag is a widely recognized environment, so what if instead of other players, we filled a laser tag arena with targets? Eight weeks later, this is what I produced. The environment is the bulk of the work I completed. With assistance from our ingenious programmer Talon Epting, and UI art from our asset creator Jordan Anderson, we were able to create a truly unique yet recognizable laser tag arena with an abundance of classic sci-fi elements. Black lights, atmospheric fog, neon spotlights, and emissive textures are all used to craft a grounded, believable, and most of all, a fun gameplay experience with an immersive environment. Hello, I am Ryan Tafalowski, and I am the Western Exhibition Level Designer for Threes Too Many. This is our Western Exhibition level. It is a procedurally generated level in which it will take four tiles out of a pool of 12 and arrange them in a random layout. There are over 10,000 different possible combinations using each of these tiles in different layouts for this level. It was quite the fun challenge coming up with a bunch of different tile layouts for this level using the same props to make different layouts that would be both fun and interactive to, with the player. It was quite challenging to dictate player th flow through this level. Because it's a procedurally generated level with a square shape, I couldn't dictate where the player would be coming from or where they'd be going in this level. The revolver has got to be my favorite work of anything I've made for this level. The modeling and texturing came together really well to make a really interesting looking weapon that I can be proud of. Hello, my name is Talon Epting. I am the character and gameplay programmer for Three is Too Many. Alright, welcome to Three's Too Many. I'll be your host for the tutorial. The player starts off in this enclosed area where they encounter a number of on-screen prompts that tell them what the controls are and how they can engage with the game. I'm particularly proud of implementing all of the features they're capable of. Sprinting, crouching, jumping, sliding, I'm also particularly fond of how the weapons turned out. They each use the exact same script, though their values are highly individualized. Everything from range to fire rate. Animations, done by Brian, can be toggled on and off from the 
pause menu, as you can see here, which I find particularly useful for the aim down sights feature, especially with the rifle. The targets themselves also use the exact same script with different values, as you can see. If you come down here, you find that the controls can be accessed from the pause menu anytime you wish. Hi, my name is Brian Walshimer, and I am the prop animator and UI programmer for Threes Too Many. Hi, I'll be your guide to some of the weapon animations that are in Threes Too Many. As you can see, weapons have firing and reloading animations. Some targets also have animations to make it look as though they're reacting to the weapons being fired. Another thing that I'm really proud of is how the zooming in feature came. I hope you enjoy the game. Hello, my name is Jordan Anderson. I'm with the team Three's Too Many. I took lead on modeling the three weapons in the comp level, which is the rifle, the shotgun, and the pistol. In this video, I'll be highlighting some weapons I modeled for the competitive level. Here we have a rifle, which is a stage arm 3G rifle, something you see in a real life competitive shooting. Um, just take a closer look at the scope here, charging handle. Um, take a closer look at the, the stock in the handle. You see it has like this plastic graining look. That's something the real life model, a real life model will have. The hardest part probably was the barrel. After looking at some images online, I noticed it had this look, and I wanted to achieve that look in the model. Using the multi-cut tool and moving vertices, trying to make everything quads, quads took some time. But we eventually got it done, and I'm proud of it. And it's just the model. Move on to the shotgun, which is the um, 870 Remington pump. Has some things going on here. Attachment strap. This piece right here, as, as you see, any Remington model, I have this look right here. Got some plastic graining going on. Bolts. The inside bolt. The shell. The, the handle slides back and forth. And this is it. Up next, we have a platformer named Courageworth. With TechGuard, I focus on learning shader graphs and more about particle systems to help maximize my time and have more of a twerk on making colorful but cohesive textures. When it came to the UI, I looked back at wooden signposts to help to, in an attempt to help the player feel more of the impact as they went along with the game. Heyo, my name is Dalen, and I worked on the concept art, level design, and even did some QA testing for a game Courage. Having some of the artistic direction for a group, I started off with some concept art that would define the look for a game. I ended up just going, I ended up making a doodle with a with the main character on the left, the enemy on the right, player shooting a fire projectile towards the enemy in a cave-like setting. And that pretty much became the theme of our game. When it came to modeling the environmental art assets, I wanted to keep a simplistic yet diverse set of pieces to fit within our theme. I could have done something more stylistic or even realistic if I really wanted to. But due to time constraints, I had to push myself back a little bit. The method I took was to create them in groups for effortless placing for the level designers. Hi, my name is Mark Russo, and I did the level design and platform modeling for Courageworth. 
I designed levels 1 and 3 and I based them on 8-bit games like Super Mario Bros. and Zelda 2 which came up when we were brainstorming ideas for the game. Once the levels were blocked out, I took a look at them and I modeled the platforms that I believed would best suit each level. Once those were done, I replaced the block out with the finished platforms that were textured by Dale and another team member. After that, I play tested the game to make sure that every level was beatable. Something that I also did was uh, accommodate the level because at first the player was, was supposed to crouch but that feature was removed so some of the areas in the levels had to be uh, redone to accommodate for that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jack Lavelle and I worked on the combat for our game. In our game I wanted to focus primarily on our combat elements and how they will differ from one another upon obtaining them. Uh, both. Uh, we had, we have things from uh, piercing shots to multiple shots in, in a short time to uh, each having their own distinct uses in game. Lastly, each bell implemented plays a role in their effectiveness against enemies, whether they're effective or ineffective. Hello, my name is Jacob Godwin. I worked on our level design and modeling for our game. When it came to modeling, I modeled things like the next level sign, spell pickups, and enemy model, which the enemy model was my favorite. Just working with Dalen, getting to use his concept art to bring those ideas to life. And then for the level design, we split up our work and I worked on about half the levels and designed the layout for the boss fight. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zakari and I worked on the player movement and cutscenes for the game. My goal with the player movement was to add a natural feel to the controls with minimal discrepancies. I believe having fluidity in the controls equates to more than half of the experience. Having an interest in the art aspects for a game, I also created the cutscenes you'll see throughout the game and how it ties in with the storyline. Hello, my name is Alfredo Gomez Bernal, and I worked on the animation, 3D modeling, and the main background artist for our game. As a team lead, I ensured to keep our environment group supportive, organized, and cohesive. During that time, I also worked on the environmental backgrounds of our levels, primarily using parallax, adding depth to bring life to our dimensional choice. I also worked on the character animations for our protagonist, Luke, created by Dale and his concept art. Character animations is where I spent the majority of my time seeing how I focus on smooth transitions from state to state, ensuring fluid movement as the character moves and interacts with the environment. Thank you very much for watching your game. Let's take a look at a game that doesn't place, take place on Earth next, Astronauts. Hey, we're Darkseid Studios and this is our game, Astronauts.
Hi, my name is Marcel Valdez and I'm the lead for Astronaut as well as gameplay and AI programmer and level designer. The core of what I did came from the puzzle aspect of the game as it's the core aspect of the game. So making sure interactions between the player and the puzzles and feedback was there for the player to understand how each puzzle worked as well as interactions between the player and other aspects of the game, such as the platforming sections that we had or enemies in the game. My favorite part about development was probably getting to create the concepts and actually programming the puzzles for each game. I enjoy solving puzzles of other games or stuff like Jigsaw, so getting to work backwards and deconstructing them is very enjoyable for me to do. Ironically, the hardest part was also coming up with the ideas for each uh, puzzle as I wanted the puzzles in each section to kind of fit the theme that they were in and didn't seem too random. So getting unique puzzles for each area was quite a challenge for me to do. Hi, I'm JD Julian Davis and in Astronauts, I served as the audio engineer. I did the music, the background soundscapes, sound effects, and worked with the voice actor. The other thing I did in Astronauts was, I was the 2D artist, which means I did the user interfaces, everything in two dimensions that it was overlaid across the three-dimensional screen. The thing I liked most about Astronauts, besides creating some really good scores, was the fact that I got to work with cameras, and there are two views within the game, which were me learning how to project a view onto a 2D platform. So you have a panel that's a close view, which is a camera rendering a view of the game screen onto one of the overlays on top of the, the main play screen. Hello, my name is Elliot Nosov, and I worked as 3D artist and partial level designer in the jungle area of our game, Astronauts. The aspect of the game that I enjoyed the most, and also am the most proud of, was the temple at the end of the jungle area. It's both the most aesthetically interesting and a very mechanical, heavy area in the game, so designing it was interesting combining the mechanics of the laser-based puzzles and the aesthetics of an old ruined temple. It adds a bit of life to the world. The part of the project that was the most challenging to me was getting everyone's ideas to come together because everyone has their different skill sets, their different vision, and getting everyone to both effectively communicate what they want to do and put it together to make a cohesive product was both a struggle, but very rewarding when we finally saw all of the pieces put together to make one complete game. Hello everyone, my name is Sean Gilroy. I'm one of the artists on our astronaut project. My main responsibilities included creation, sculpting, texturing, and animation of the main character Astro One, and subsequently each of his companions. I was also responsible for level design and creation of the volcanic level, and all of the assets and textures created within, as well as some other assets and textures made for other levels. Um, easily, my favorite part of the project was to was in the creation of our main character, um, mostly because I love ZBrush and it just seems um, so intuitive to me. And the hardest was to export our levels that we had created using tile maps in Unity and recreating them in Maya and then re-importing them back into Unity. Um, but I hope all of you enjoy our game and enjoy the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Bradley Meyer, and I am a foliage artist as well as level designer for the game Astronauts. I helped in the creation of the jungle, volcano, and hub levels, as well as fully designed and textured the polar level. 
I also assisted Julian in some sound effects, and I also helped Marcel in getting the polar level to be function. I came up with the isometric view that's used during gameplay from the beginning, as I felt that that would be a lot more unique and it would make our game stand out against the competition. Uh, I also assisted in its design with the blocky trees to give it that sort of alien feel from our smooth world to a semi-blocky world. I also helped with a lot of QA testing for the game and discovered many bugs and documented them and informed people of them. And yeah, I hope you have a good time playing this year game. Hi everyone, I'm Malcolm Coronado, a programmer from Darkside Studios and 3D modeler and gameplay programmer for our game Astronauts. A concept for a puzzle that has been used in the game Astronauts is set in the volcano level where the player, twice by the way, needs to traverse through lava using the platform surrounded and on top of the lava. However, the hatch is that some of the platforms can sink, and in order to tell the difference between the ones that can sink and the ones that cannot, watch their wobbling pattern. The alien that is seen throughout the game was all modeled and textured by me. It's interesting to know that there are actually two versions of the jellyfish, with one of them being finalized. The first jellyfish that you see on your screen is actually a prototype. While the second jellyfish that you see on your screen right now is the finalized version. I am very pleased with our product and I hope that all of you have a good time with our game. Welcome! The next game doesn't feature a human character. It's named Playday. to Play Day. In Play Day, you'll use a tank to explore a maze of imagination. Explore high and low, near and far, to rescue your missing toys from the evil red tanks. Find all the toys, and you'll get to fight the dreaded big tank. Along the way, you'll find additional weapons to increase your arsenal. Fun meets a whole new level in Play Day by Psionic Technologies. Hello everyone, I am Logan Holt, and I am the team lead and lead programmer of Psionic Technologies, the team bringing you Play Day. I also served as an assistant level designer of sorts, primarily when it came to implementing collision and triggers into the level. In Play Day, you play as a toy tank and explore a labyrinth inside of a house to find your missing toy soldiers. As you explore the house, you'll encounter enemy tanks that block your path and find new weapons to strengthen your arsenal. The game takes place within the child's imagination, which inspired using various toys and household objects to build the level's geometry. This gives our game a very appealing aesthetic that kids will enjoy. My favorite part of making this game was making the systems for the tank's control and the weapons. I programmed the tank controls in a way so that they could be controlled by a player, or an AI that feeds inputs into the same scripts for controlling the tanks. The result is that the tank logic was consistent for both the player and enemies, saving time and effort in development throughout the process. The biggest challenge we faced, in my opinion, Programming-wise, it was largely getting all that we wanted into the game, while also implementing quality-of-life features. All in a pretty short time frame of five weeks, due to plans changing midway through the semester. There were a lot of late nights, for me especially, in the mid-stages of making this game. Overall, I'm very proud of, my, of the work my team has accomplished, and I hope you enjoy our game. Hello, my name is Jay Caldwell. I am the 3D prop modeler, the final artist, and the level designer for Playday. My favorite job for working on Playday would have to be level designer. I enjoy making levels for games for my buddies to play whenever we are. So when they asked me to do this, I was really happy. I enjoy making puzzles, mazes, I enjoy in general. 
One of the most difficult challenges for Plato to me, though, had to be working in Unity. I haven't worked in Unity for so long. I've always been working on Unreal Engine, and that just came so naturally. So when I had, when we came back to Unity, I had to ask for help. I had people teach me how to use Unity again, where the settings were, how to do certain things. And they did. And once we got everything settled, uh, it took off naturally. I signed the level, made the puzzles, made mazes. It was really fun. And I hope you all enjoy it too. Hi everyone, I'm Joel Davenport. I was the UI artist as well as the painter of all the materials in Play Day. I also did uh, some QA. My favorite part about the project was playing the game and QAing it with my son. He is eight. And our target audience was around his age. So we really wanted to get his feedback. And he loved the game. He, he was really proud of what uh, we all did in a short amount of time. And uh, I, in turn, am very proud of the level design, the programming. All, all of the hard work that our team did when we came together and we had a uh, clear direction and the amount of work we did in a short amount of time was phenomenal and I hope everyone has a great experience playing this game and thank you for your time. Hello, my name is William Goldman and I am the assistant programmer for Playday. I assist with the anime AI and getting combat with the player up and running. As my group may have mentioned, we used to be working on a third-person shooter. I am most familiar with the humanoid enemies featured in this past game, the way they act, move, etc. So these tank enemies were a different challenge for me. A tank-like enemy with a head that turns independently of its body was a unique challenge. We had to re rework the enemy movement and aiming from scratch, because obviously, a tank doesn't move the same as a human. The nav mesh would have made a great tool, but it made the tanks feel a little too cartoony, so a new system was made. Through various checks, the tank could generate a point, tell if it's to the right or the left, and then rotate accordingly. This allowed the tank to spin on the spot, then move, rather than spin and move at the same time like with the nav mesh. I hope you enjoy our game, play day. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Flicker and I am the assistant programmer for the game Play Day. As stated in the group roles, I worked with the UI for the game. I implemented things such as the pause menu, the main menu, the mini map, and the windscreen. I placed the UI elements where they needed to be and used assets that were UI assets that were designed by Joel. One of my favorite things that I like to do in this game was test to see if there are any major bugs in the game and also playing the game. And from what we have started from when the creation of the game, I had most of the UI elements already implemented, but over the course of the time, I had to update them by adding art to the buttons and the panels. And also, I added some new stuff like the option between simple advanced controls and the weapon UI. Alright, for simple controls, is when you, the tank moves in the direction that you can and moves in the tank's direction going. And with advanced controls, it, the turning is handled manually. Before beta, we had to make a change to our roles in our group. But seeing it with Jay's level design work, it made this game something special. This concludes this mess my message. I hope you enjoy Play Day. My name is Joseph Pertillo, and I'm the main tank's designer, assistant modeler, and I was in charge of the sound effects and music. I'm also the one who came up with the idea for the current game we've created. The original game that we were making was not working out. So instead, I suggested how about we use the tank that I have been creating as the main player, and we should make it a toy tank. And that way, we can still reuse the props that we were working on. And that way, it could take in the child's imagination. So we talked back and forth what the story should be with one another and we decided it's a child's imagination that way it can explain why you're fighting off other tanks, why you're collecting these toy soldiers, and also why when you reach the parents room you fight this big boss tank. 
I'm really proud of my team. We've all been putting in a lot of work, especially a lot of crunch time, and we've all been applying a bit of ourselves into the game. I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy Play Day! Finally, the last game of the evening is Conjure Quest. In the great tower of the keep, the wizards gather to enjoy a lovely cup of tea together. Tragedy strikes as a freshly prepared cup of tea is knocked over, causing its rich contents to spill on the table. This insult cannot be tolerated, and wizards do not settle disputes simply. Fisticuffs are, of course, far too vulgar to be tolerated by these old bones, and chess is far too simple for minds of this caliber. No, what we need is something more magical. Welcome to Conjure Quest, the game nine out of ten wizards recommend to resolve quarrels by managing your magical creations on an even greater magical board. Hello and welcome to Conjure Quest. I'm Brennan Sullivan and I had the pleasure of being the team lead for this project. I know we all worked really hard and had a great time on this project and the whole team is really excited to introduce themselves to you. So let's get on to that. My name is Tristan Beecher, and I am the UI designer in Conjure Quest. My name is Jonathan Hamill. I am an artist and sound designer for Conjure Quest. Hello, my name is Christine Gordoski, and I'm a 3D artist. My name is Jacob Coleman. I am the networking programmer, as well as the core systems designer and programmer. My name is Chapin Real, and I'm a 3D artist and tech artist on Conjure Quest. Hey, I'm Brennan Sullivan, and I had the pleasure of being team lead for Contra Quest along with one of its two main programmers. I designed systems of player input into the game and systems the player would use to interact with the map, like settlements, buildings, and units. It was amazing to work with this team to break down what we wanted to do in our next step every week, and I think my favorite part was just watching as all of that, those things that we've been working on every week just came together to make this amazing game. During this project, I found that making a networked multiplayer game is both challenging and rewarding. While there are plenty of networking issues early on, learning to fix them was probably my favorite part of this project, and is something I will hopefully be able to expand upon during my career. Finding a solution to some of these networking issues was extremely rewarding to me, especially when it was something I was teaching myself. Something that is similarly rewarding is seeing this project finally come to completion. I'm both excited and proud of how Conjure Quest turned out, and I can't wait to let everyone play it. My primary role was creating the 3D assets. I modeled and textured some of the environment objects. I also modeled and textured the level 2 structure, ghost and mushroom units, as well as a few of the game tiles. I also helped with designing the main menu UI and creating the elements for it. One of the greatest things I got from making Conjure Quest was watching it come to life as we put all of the pieces together. I worked on some of the tiles and the environment pieces for the game, as well as some of the more technical art aspects such as shaders and working with the lighting and the post-processing to help make all of the elements come together and feel like this board is coming to life, like it's these wizards creating these little terrariums that are put together to allow them to play this game. One of my favorite parts working on the game was getting to create shaders like the water shader to add sort of elements of movement uh, that the player would get to see and just sort of feel like they're one of the wizards playing uh, the game. I've created the design assets for the main UI lobby screen and the faction selection screen and the resource tree. I've also created concept art for the faction info screens and my favorite part about this project was working with a talented and dedicated team that I can't think enough for allowing me to work on a very important part of the Conjure Quest. My name is Jonathan. 
I helped out with the modeling and the texturing and other artist stuff, but primarily I was the audio guy for Contra Quest. I created all the sounds, I composed the music, and I basically directed the sound of the game. What I'm most proud of in particular would have to be the music, which I composed with Bevel Studio and Spitfire Labs. I was able to craft this sort of subtle soundscape of mandolins, strings, dulcimers, and other instruments that are included with Spitfire Labs. And it sort of blended in with and enhanced the fantasy themes of this game while not completely distracting from it. One of my dream jobs is to become a video game composer, and working on this project has definitely helped cement that as one. Conjure Quest was originally envisioned as a village management simulator, but as we came up with further ideas and looked at other games for how we wanted it to play, it evolved into this multiplayer turn-based strategy game. When we were throwing around a lot of ideas for how to make the game more unique, we came up with the idea of the game being this sort of ritual that wizards would use to resolve disputes. That's how we arrived at the idea of Conjure Quest. The simple goal of Conjure Quest is to be the first player to reach the winning point total. That point total gets set by the host at the beginning of the game, and is hopefully something that everyone agreed on. People can get points through creating more settlements or upgrading their existing ones, but to do that, they need resources. That's where the resource management comes in. Players get resources based on where they've placed their settlements and what buildings those settlements have. Making more settlements is easy enough. New settlers can be trained at any current settlement that a player has, and then those settlers can be moved anywhere that's eligible for a building and given the right resources and they'll make a new settlement. Upgrading settlements is simple once it's been researched, but it takes quite a few resources. Making more buildings is how a player can really take off in resource production. To get more buildings that they can make, each player can research a new building every turn, and then they can construct those buildings in their settlements. The first tier of each building will just give a small bonus in resources gathered, but the second tier doubles the amount gathered. This gives a nice balance of wanting to get all of the resources, but also not wanting to have to spend too much on different buildings when placing settlements. To make the system a little more forgiving though, we added a system where you can trade resources you have too many of for other resources. This starts out at a pretty bad ratio of 4 to 1, but there are two buildings that can be built to get the ratio down to 2 to 1. All in all, we did our best to make a balanced game where everyone would feel like they could be in the running for victory, and have fun grabbing for territory. Like any good team, we had our problem spots. I think our main struggles were just looking at the scope of the game and trying to figure out what parts we were going to be able to include and have be as perfect as we wanted. And there were definitely some things that got cut, but I think all of that has gone forward to make Conjure Quest into a wonderful product that we're all very proud of. I'd like to thank you again for coming to this presentation. Please don't forget to, to use the links below to visit the teams in their live streams so you can play their games and talk with them directly. I know that they would appreciate uh, all of you going and you know having conversations, asking questions, giving them some live feedback. But please also don't forget to fill out the surveys for the students. You can find all of these links below in the description in YouTube. I hope to see you again next year, and hopefully next year we will be able to be in person again.